So this talk will be about the question, what is an etalmorphism from X to Y? So in, in previous lectures, I was talking about the etal topology and giving some idea of how to calculate it, but I never actually defined what an etal morphism actually was. So I want to try and repair this. Um, the first question is, what does etal mean? Well, it's a French word, which means slack. Um, and this is not really very helpful. You sometimes get the impression that when people like Sarah and Grothendick were inventing all this terminology, they opened a dictionary completely at random and chose a random adjective. So I have no idea why these are called slack morphisms. Anyway, um, what I'm going to do first is define etal morphisms for the usual topology of complex manifolds. And then we will use that to motivate the definition for um, etal morphisms of schemes. So an etal um, morphism f from x to y is one such that um, one that is a local homeomorphism. What this means is that um, uh, given the point x in x, it has a neighborhood u so that f is a, a homeomorphism from u to the image. So um, a picture of this is as follows. Typical etal morphism, X might be um, some sort of double cover of a circle. So Y might be a circle. And what it's saying is that if you choose any point in X, like this one, there's some little neighborhood such that the map to its image in Y is a homeomorphism. Um, so here are some typical examples. So first of all, if we have an open set U contained in X, then the inclusion is obviously et al. Um, secondly, if we take, say, the non-zero complex numbers and map it to the non-zero complex numbers by mapping Z, goes to Z to the N, this is et al. But you can see if we allow the zero complex number, that's not an et al um, um, map because it's not a local I mean, you, you can't find a neighborhood on which it's an isomorphism. Um, a third example is if we take the line with two points and map it to the line, then that's also a tal. In fact, you can, you can see if you take this point here, it's got a perfectly good neighborhood that maps homeomorphically to a neighborhood of there. So, so, so um, a tal maps are allowed to be non Hausdorff. In fact, they quite often are. Um, etal maps from X to Y are more or less the same as sheaves over Y. Um, in fact, um, in the early days of sheath theory, sheaves were often defined as etal maps rather than maps from open sets to something or other. And the way you get from one to the other is, is if you've got an etal map, the corresponding sheaf is just the um, is just given by sections of f x to y. In other words, for each open set in y, you just take the maps from u to x that are sections, and and that gives you the value of the sheaf on y. On the other hand, if you've got a sheaf, then we can define um, the the, the etale space x over y um, to be the union of the fibers of the sheaf over points of Y. And you can put a topology on these and check it's an etal map. Um, so um, the next question is, what are sheaves for the etal topology? So remember we said there was something called an etal topology in algebraic geometry, and you could define some rather funny looking sheaves for it. So, so um, let's think about um, sheaves for the usual topology, um, here we're talking about a, a complex manifold Y 
with the usual complex topology. So a sheaf for the usual topology means for each open set in Y, we're given a set, and this has to be functorial and satisfy some sort of covering condition. So a sheaf for the etal topology means that for each etal map from X to Y, we're given a set, and this is functorial and satisfies covering conditions and whatever. And the point is that sheaves for the usual topology are more or less the same as sheaves for the etal topology. And that's because if you've got an etal map from X to Y, say draw a typical etal map, looks something like this. And um, the point is it's covered by sets that are isomorphic to open sets of Y. In fact, that's more or less the definition of an entire covering. So the point is X is covered by open sets of Y. Well, um, when I say it's covered by open sets of Y, I mean it's covered by sets that are isomorphic to open sets of Y. Um, so this means, so, so any sheaf on X, so any etal sheaf on X is determined by its values on open sets U in Y, because there's a sort of covering condition for sheaves that says that if um, some, an open set is covered by other open sets and the sheaf on this is determined. So what this means is that sheaves for the usual topology are more or less the same as sheaves for the etal topology. So, so in this particular case, the etal topology isn't any different from the usual one, for at least for most practical purposes. So that, 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 that covers etal maps for complex manifolds with the usual topology. Now we want to look at etal maps in algebraic geometry, where we're going to use the Zariski topology. And let's see what happens. So let's try attempt number one, which will fail. Um, let's, let, let, let's consider maps f, x to y that are local isomorphisms. What this means is that any x in x has an open neighborhood U such that F on U to the image is an isomorphism, um, say an isomorphism of schemes. So um, this, this is the obvious analog of the definition of a tile map we gave. And well, it's a perfectly good definition of a local isomorphism, but it fails as an analog of a tile maps. And it fails in two ways. First of all, if we take the map from the non-zero elements of a field to itself, taking x to x squared, say, this is not a local isomorphism in the Zariski topology. So you see, if we take this map here and we map it to there, if we, if we take a point here and we take an open neighborhood in the usual complex topology, that's quite easy, it's a small set there. But an open neighborhood in the Zariski topology is huge. It's sort of everything except a finite number of points. And it certainly doesn't map isomorphically to anything in there. So, so the, the, the map taking x to x squared in, um, is, is, not a, is not a local isomorphism, but we want it to be a tal. Um, the second reason it fails is that sheaves are the same as Zariski sheaves. So you remember we were introducing etal sheaves and etal cohomology in order to get different cohomology groups because the cohomology groups constructed using the Zariski topology were much too small in general. So um, using local isomorphisms is just not going to give us any better cohomology groups. We're going to get the same sheaves and the same cohomology groups as for the Zariski topology. So we need to do something else to find a good analog of etal maps. 
Um, so let's think about why does it not work? So why does it fail? And the answer is, so risky open sets are too big. We saw this, that the Zariski open set was of a, of a circle was everything but a finite number of points on the circle, and so it couldn't be a local isomorphism. So we want to find a way to kind of say something is a local isomorphism in a, in a more local way than for Zariski sets. Well, let's take a look. First of all, if we've got a local isomorphism and we've got a point here, and its image might be y, which is f of x, then we get an isomorphism from the local ring of x. Um, sorry, it goes from the local ring of y to the local ring of x. So this would be an isomorphism. If if this is a, if this map is a local isomorphism, it means all the maps of local rings are, are, are isomorphisms. Um, and local rings see too much of x in algebraic geometry. I mean, it sees all of x, but a, except for co-dimension one subsets and some sets. And there's a variation of the local ring that sees far less. We can take the completion rx hat and ry hat. And these are also going to be isomorphic if it's a local isomorphism, but the completion sees much less. For example, if we take a curve that looks like that and a curve that's just the intersection of two lines, the um, local rings at this point is going to be quite different from the local ring at that point. But the completion of the local ring at this point is going to be the same as the completion of the local ring at this point. So the, the completion of a local ring is seeing far less of the variety. Um, so we can just say this is an isomorphism for all points x, where y is the image of x. And this gives a reasonably good definition of etal maps. This works for varieties over um, algebraically closed fields. Um, so if all you want to do is mess around with varieties over algebraically closed fields, you can use this as the definition of an et al map. It just has to be a, an isomorphism on local rings. Um, well, um, there are, however, some problems with this definition. First of all, it's a little bit clumsy to use because completions of local rings are not exactly an elementary concept. Um, secondly, we want to work with varieties that are not over algebraically closed fields and this definition just goes wrong. It also goes wrong even if we're just looking at the um, spectrum of fields, in other words single points. I mean we, we saw last lecture that a tal cohomology is more or less equivalent to Galois cohomology in the case of fields and it just isn't if you use this definition. So, so we need to modify this a bit. And let's look at it a bit more closely. So what do we need to get an isomorphism of local rings Ry to Rx? Well, let's think about what the completion of Ry is. Well, it's an inverse limit where we take Ry over maximal ideal or Ry over the maximal ideal squared or Ry over the maximal ideal cubed and so on. So what we want to do is to, um, in order to define a, a map from the local ring to the local ring of x, we need to define compatible maps from all of these. And the way we do can do this is we start with a map from this ring and then we lift it to a map from this ring and then we lift it to a map from this ring and so on. In other words, we have to solve the following problem. We, we want the spectrum of Ry over m to the n plus 1, mapping to x, mapping to the spectrum of r of y over m to the n, mapping to y. And we want to find a lifting of this map. So this says that, um, uh, sorry, that should be an n and that should be an n plus 1. In other words, if we've managed to lift this 
ring to a map of x, we want to lift it to a map of this ring to a map of x. And if we do this for all n and stick them together, we've got a map from the local ring of y to x. Well, this suggests the following problem. Suppose we've got x and y, and we've got the spectrum of some ring mapping to y, and we've got the spectrum of some ring modulo, an ideal, well, we could take n squared equals naught, or we could if we want to take n to be nil potent. And we want to know, is there a, given this configuration where, where c is some ring and n is a nil potent ideal, we can ask, does there exist a lifting here? And we say, this, is, this condition is almost the definition of et al. We say x to y is formally et al, If um, this map G, if there is a unique map G making this diagram commute for any choice of C and N. Um, um, by the way, there are two other very similar conditions. We say it's formally smooth if there's at least one G. And we say it's formally unramified if there's at most one G. So, um, a for, so something is formally et al, if and only if it's both formally smooth and formally unramified. Formally smooth maps turn out to be very closely related to the notion of non-singular varieties. So if Y is the spectrum of an algebraically closed field, then a map from a variety to there is, is form formally smooth if and only if this is a, a regular um, variety in the sense of algebraic geometry. Anyway, we're mainly interested in, in, in the formally et al ones. Um, well, that's, that almost gives us the definition for et al. Um, formally et al ones, uh, it turns out there's some sort of pathological cases and Grothendieck found the right condition for et al maps. So et and a, a map x to y is a tau, if and only if it's formally a tau plus locally of finite presentation. Um, so in practice, this condition being locally of finite presentation is almost always satisfied, trivially satisfied in any map you're considering. So Formally, et al is in practice more or less the same as et al. Um, incidentally, smooth and unramified are defined in the same way. They're, 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 they're smooth if they're formally smooth and locally finite presentation, and the same for unramified. Um, so um, we should um, um, give some um, examples. Um, First of all, the, the trouble with this definition is a bit hard to get your head around it. So let, let, let's first of all look at a very simple example. Suppose we take x to y, and suppose this is a tau, and suppose we take a point and a point with a little tangent vector like this. So this would be the spectrum of some field k that you're working over, and this might be the spectrum of k of x over x squared, which is really a point with a little bit sticking out in it in some sense. And this map being a tau means we can always find a unique lifting. So let's draw a picture of this. What it means is if we choose a point of X and we choose a point of Y and a little tangent vector at this point in some sense, then we can lift this tangent vector to a tangent vector in X uniquely. So, so in particular, et al means you can uniquely lift tangent vectors. And that's obviously closely related to the idea of this being a, in some sense, a local isomorphism. Um, so um, let's give some examples of maps that are or aren't et al. So, so let's look at the spectrum of K of X over x squared, mapping to the spectrum of k. So this looks like a point and a point with a little bit sticking out mapping to it. And we can ask, is this a tau? Um, 
Well, for this, we need to we need to check the following conditions. So we've got this map spectrum of C over N, mapping to the spectrum of C, mapping to the spectrum of K, mapping to spectrum of Kx over x squared. And um, we want to know if there's a unique map like this. And let's turn this into a, a question about rings by reversing all the arrows. So, so we've got a map from k to k of x over x squared, and this maps to some algebra c, and this maps to some algebra c over n. And we want to know if we can find a lifting like that. And the answer is you can't always. For instance, we can take this element c to be k of x over x cubed. And you can take n to be the ideal generated by x squared. So this is k of x over x squared. And you can take this to be the identity map. And you can see there's no way of lifting this map here because this, this must map it to um, x plus something. And um, x plus something squared is never going to be 0 in this ring, although it can, can be 0 in that ring. So this map is not a tau. And that's very plausible geometrically because this doesn't sort of look infinitesimally like this. So, so a way to think of a tile maps is as follows. Suppose you've got a space X and a space Y. What a tile means is that if you've got some something in Y, so this might be the spectrum of C. And suppose we've got spectrum of C here. Sorry, spectrum of C over N. Um, then suppose you suppose you extend this infinite, infinitesimally by by making it um, um, so going from this scheme to this scheme is is kind of a sort of making it infinitesimally bigger. So it says that if you extend this infinitesimally, then we can lift this to, to the, 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 the scheme x. So, so we can sort of um, lift infinitesimal thickenings of, of, of a subscheme. And you can see you can't do that here. If, if you sort of, um, um, no, never mind. Um, uh, so um, for another example, I, I want to look at some cases over an algebraically uh, over a field that isn't algebraically closed. So the next example is going to be, let's take a field um, which is not algebraically closed. I'm going to take L to be a finite separable extension. So you remember this means L is of the form K of x modulo f of x, where f is irreducible and um, has um, no multiple factors over the algebraic closure of k. Um, this is equivalent to saying that f and its derivative are co-prime. In particular, this means a f prime plus b f equals one for some a and b. So a f equals a f prime equals one in L. So so the derivative of f at x is so the derivative of f is now invertible. Now we've got to ask the question: Is spectrum of L to spectrum of, of k a tau? So we need to look at the following diagram. Um, we have C over N and spectrum of C goes to here. It's very difficult remembering which way around all these arrows go. And we want to know if we can lift it like that. And as usual, it's easier to write this in terms of rings. So let's take this. And we want to know, is there a lifting of L to C? Well, we have to map x to something in C. And x maps to something in C over n. 
and we can lift that to an element C of C. Um, but if we map X to that, that's not necessarily um, a homomorphism of rings. So what we want to do is we want to find um, N in this ideal N so that F of C plus N equals zero, because then we can map X to this element C plus N. And we're allowed to add N to C because that will still have the same image in here. So um, we know F of C is in the ideal N. Um, so um, we want to solve F of C plus N, which is F of C plus F prime of C times N because um, N is nilpotent. And we want, we, want to, we want this to be equal to zero. And we can solve this equation because F prime of C is um, invertible. So we can choose N so that F of C plus N equals zero. And that gives us our mapping from L to C. So finite separable extensions are et al. And this is really useful because um, knowing finite separable extensions is more or less the same as knowing the absolute Galois group of a field K. So what this turns out to mean is that a tal cohomology of the spectrum of a field is more or less the same as the Galois cohomology of that field. And if you remember, we used that several times in working out the um, cohomology of a curve. Um, incidentally, notice that we were working out the cohomology of a curve over an algebraically closed field. But in doing that, we needed to work out the Galois cohomology of a non-algebraically closed field, the field of rational functions on the curve. So this is why you need to know um, etal maps for non-algebraically closed fields, even if you're working with varieties over algebraically closed fields. Um, we should finish off just by showing that inseparable extensions are not et al. So here's an example of an inseparable extension. So let's take a field K of characteristic P and let's map it to some inseparable extension K of X modulo X to the P minus A, where A is some um, element in K that's not a pth power. And now we, we have the following lifting problem. We're going to take this map to be a, the, the identity map. So we just map k of x over x to the p minus a. And now um, we want to show that we can't solve this lifting problem for something here. So we've got to find a suitable something. And we can just take k of x epsilon and mod out by the ideal generated by epsilon squared and x to the p minus a minus epsilon. And now what we need to do to lift this map is to find a pth root of x to the a minus epsilon. So um, a plus epsilon has no pth root. If we try to find a pth root of the form um, x plus something times epsilon to the p, which is the obvious thing to do. This is just x to the p plus p times something. And this is just zero because we're in characteristic p. And this is just eps and this is just equal to a. So this is not equal to a plus epsilon. So, so we can't lift, uh, so, so we can't find a lifting of this map here. And inseparable extensions are not et al. Okay, that's all about etal maps for the moment.